All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Daniel L. Davis. He's at Defense Priorities, and he writes all the time now for 1945. It's the digits, 1-9, and then 45 spelled out. And uh, I guess that's all about uh, the nukes, before and after the nukes, before and after the end of World War II and the rise of the new order. Um, the American liberal rules-based international order of governance and cooperation, otherwise known as the American Empire. Uh, and uh, here he's got a few great ones, including, to start, David Petraeus is wrong. Boy, there's an evergreen statement for all time. <laughs> The Afghanistan war was never winnable. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing really good, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Happy to have you here. And uh, you guys, I didn't really uh, give this man his due. This guy's one of the great heroes of America's war in Afghanistan. And that is because at the end of the surge in 2012, he broke ranks and told the truth about what was going on in that war, that David Petraeus was lying about how the war was going and... Um, you know, I don't know, probably help give Obama ammunition to stick by his drawdown. He delayed it a little bit, but not very much when he drew down from the height of the surge. Um, but most of all, consequences aside, most of all, a great truth teller of that war. Sort of a twin with the great Matthew Ho, who warned that the surge wasn't going to work three years before. Um, yeah, and he so, did. yeah. Anyway, very happy to have you back on the show. And would you just remind us, Danny, and, and oh, and I should have mentioned too, um, with H.R. McMaster and under the command of uh, later Colonel Douglas McGregor, you were involved in the great tank battle of Iraq War I, uh, famously there. And then you were also were in Iraq War II as well as Afghanistan, uh, which is important for people to know and, and decorated with uh, bronze stars and all these things. Um, but so can you tell us about your role in Afghanistan um, and, and in fact, what gave you that sort of special advantage that the average lieutenant colonel probably did not have on the ground there uh, in order to tell the story that you did tell back in 2012? Yeah, as it turned out, I, I had I, I, I would say maybe the most uh, accurate window and ability to see what was going on on the ground uh, possibly of any in single individual in Afghanistan, because I, I was the chief of the Army's Rapid Equipping Force, which was an organization uh, created during the, the a, after the 9-11 wars had started to get new Army equipment through the bureaucratic uh, hurdles a lot faster so that when new inter, uh, equipment needs emerged during conflict that the units didn't have to wait years to get it because obviously they would be rotated out by then. So they had this organization that was designed to find out what troops needed right now and then source it with whatever they could that was available immediately so that it could be deployed into theater while the unit still was there to need it. And so as a result of that, they sent me, I, I was the, the team chief for the Afghan version of that. There was also one in Iraq um, and sent there with the requirement that I had to visit and, and talk to all the senior commanders of the regional commands, basically the division level commanders with uh, brigade commanders, and then go all the way down to battalion company and even platoon uh, all the way literally to the tip of the spear out on you know foot patrols, uh, ground patrols, going out with special forces and some of their missions uh, at the, you know, on the ground throughout all the areas that were, uh, really the most critical ones for the army uh, from the, the northern northeastern part of the country up along the Pakistan border down to the central part and then into the southern uh, uh, of, of Afghanistan 
uh, all, all throughout there. I, I, I traveled a total during my one year tour from 2010 to 2011, over 9,000 miles going back and forth between my two headquarters in, in uh, uh, Bagram and uh, Kandahar. And then we had a couple of others uh, or one other one that was kind of out at a remote outpost. And then I just went to all these different places uh, throughout the entire area. So I was able to talk with the, the lowest grunts, you know, the, the, the infantry month, the sergeants, the lieutenants, captains, uh, and then the lieutenant colonel, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, and then all the way up to the, the, the generals who were commanding. So I had really about the best view of anyone you could imagine, because I was high enough in rank that a general would talk to me and a colonel would talk to me, but I wasn't too high in rank that uh, even a, a private would be willing to talk to me because I was, uh, you know, just kind of out there with them and sometimes sitting with their their officers, smoking cigars and whatever in between missions. Um, so I really had a great view of everything that was going on there, to include the Afghan uh, so troops as well, and as I went on some of the patrols with them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really something. Um, and so then what happened was, and now I'm sorry, remind me the years, because just in case people don't remember, Obama announced the surge at the end of 2009. And really, they'd been escalating all year long in 2009 um, the, right. with 40,000 something troops. Then he had another 30 on top of the 40 is what really happened. Um, and then right. they brought in NATO as well. But so... Um, so now you're there in, in, in what time and, and what was it that these people were telling you and, and were there exceptions or everyone was just saying, I want to go home or what? Yeah. So the, the surge officially kicked off in January of 2010 under, uh, general McChrystal at the time. And he was replaced about, I guess, six or eight months later by general Petraeus, um, and I joined the the foray in in October of 2010. So literally at the height. I mean that all the troops uh, surge troops had deployed by by the summer of 2010. So I got there just after the top uh, the 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 uh, height of all the troops were there. It was about 140,000 U.S. and NATO troops there at that time. And I stayed all the way through until. October of, uh, or November rather of, of 2011. So a full 12 months on the ground throughout that period of time. And just to, just to back up just a hair, uh, I had actually written an extensive article, uh, a report rather in, uh, I believe it was August or September of 2009 when, when, when the, uh, president Obama was considering, the surge and was, you know, openly pondering about it and, you know, in the news that he was visiting with various generals and whatnot. And I argued then in a very detailed report that it was a bad idea that if you, if you, the report was called, which I think you can still find online if you Google it, go big or go deep. And uh, the, the gist of it was that if you go big, which is what, of course, it eventually happened, there's this whole list of things that I said are likely going to happen as a result. And we're not going to succeed at the Afghan army is, is going to be we're going to try to make it too big and it won't be sustainable. That The Afghan government is, is too corrupt that the uh, that the Pakistani uh, uh, safe havens that where they were supporting the Taliban. If you can't get rid of that, there's almost nothing else that's going to matter. All, all those things, why you shouldn't do it. And I said we should instead withdraw the majority of our combat forces and maybe leave a small special operations footprint to to go after any you know direct threats to the u.s etc um and and of course we didn't do that then in 2010 i uh, i wrote another piece before i deployed and it was and in it i started off the very first sentence was the the war in afghanistan is going so badly that if we don't make major changes we will lose this war I, as far as i know I'm the very first one in the West and certainly in the U.S. that directly claimed that we were on a path to lose the war if we didn't make changes. And, and throughout the rest of that article, I listed again all the reasons why things that we had to change uh, <clears throat> or we would lose the war. We didn't change any of them and we lost for the, exactly those reasons. So when just before I deployed, Petraeus had gone to Congress and, and had been uh, on the media left and right talking about, hey, this these uh, this surge troops and the things that he's trying to reprise from his so-called Iraq surge in 2007 
which tactically did succeed very well. He said that it's, you know, uh, we're now starting to see the same things in Afghanistan. Things are getting better. We've arrested the momentum of the Taliban. Uh, we're making progress in, in all these different areas. The government's becoming less corrupt. The Afghan gov- military is becoming more capable. You know, all of those things. And I thought, wow, OK, well, maybe I was wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be wrong if it's going to end the war and it's going to stop the killing. I'm all for that. And so I was actually looking forward to going there and to be in you know, any kind of a part of something that's going to you know, help usher this in. And I thought, man, it would be great if I could be there when the war ended. That would be super cool to to be a part of something, to see this successfully ended. So I had hoped that I was wrong and I, that he was what he was saying was true. But when I got there and I started going out on the very first patrol that I went, which actually was a, a, a joint operation with the Polish military, uh, up in the northern part of, uh, of Afghanistan. And, and I was like, oh, my Lord, that not a thing he said was true. And then I thought, well, maybe this is just this one area. And so then I went into the Kunar province and, and then into several other provinces that are also astride the, the Pakistan border. And every single place that I went, every soldier I talked to, every patrol I personally observed, reinforced that nothing Petraeus had said was true, nothing that – Michelle Flournoy had said, who was in the, uh, I believe, the deputy secretary of defense in, in testimony. All these things they kept saying about progress was just fiction. I mean, there was nothing to it at all. And, uh, you know, and I became, you know, embittered. And then, of course, when when I think I've told you before that when some soldiers that I had met during my tour were later uh, killed in a roadside bomb, and I knew that they had been killed for absolutely no gain. And, of course, they're just two of thousands that were uh, similarly killed for no value to our country and no help to Afghanistan. Uh, that's when I came to the conclusion that I, I was not able to keep my mouth shut. And I had to go public with what I knew, you know, when I got back just after the first of the year in 2012. Yeah. All right. Now everybody knows David Petraeus is a pathetic fraud and a liar and a scumbag and a lousy general who you talk about his tactical victory in Iraq. You mean for Iran's strategy of putting the Dawah and Supreme Islamic Council in power? Yep, that's Dave Petraeus, all right. Same guy who armed up Al-Qaeda in Mosul before that. But anyway, um, I asked you in 2000, and I'm going to say 13 or 14 or something maybe, when I first interviewed you. Or, well, I don't know if it was when I first interviewed you, first or second or third or something like that. But I says to you, I says, okay, but if it wasn't this ridiculous, incompetent boob David Petraeus, uh, but instead had been a competent general. And if instead of 140,000 troops, and you could just forget the 40, because NATO doesn't count. They weren't doing nothing anyway, right? In sandals <laughs> and flip-flops, that was what ISAF stood for, right? So um, if uh, I said to you then, I said, if it had been a competent general and he had had not 100,000 troops, but 500,000 troops, like the coin doctrine says, well, what then? I mean, might that have worked or it still would have been a fool's errand? And you said it still would have been a fool's errand because the more we escalate, the worse it made it. And short of, I guess, just carpet bombing the place with H-bombs and eradicating the people you're trying to pacify, you're just not going to pacify them. You put in 500,000 troops, you're just going to make one million more insurgents. Forget it. And that's where the title of the book, Fool's Errand, came from, was that discussion. But so... I mean, do I remember that right? Am I paraphrasing you there correctly? That this thing was just oh, yeah. hopeless, right? Yeah, I mean, hell, the, the Russians killed a million people and they lost. Yeah, right. And and and, and I, I will never forget, uh, before I deployed on that second one to Afghanistan, uh, I actually had sat down with Matthew Ho, the great Matthew Ho you mentioned a minute ago. Uh, and, and he's the one that, that first told me because, you know, he had been on the ground and, it, of course, he had resigned. Uh, to great fanfare over the policies. And I remember so clearly when he told me at one of our first meetings, uh, he said, the more you send over there, the more enemies you're going to make because these people historically and culturally over centuries have viewed all foreign militaries as occupiers, no matter what anybody says, no matter what good things they may do. And if you sent over a large force and the Soviets proved it, if you send a large force, then you're just going to create more enemies and there's going to be more casualties. But you are definitely not going to succeed militarily. And it just took us 20 years to prove that that was still true. Mm. 
Well, look, I mean, this was even the doctrine of Petraeus and McChrystal themselves, right? This was McChrystal's doctrine of heroic restraint. Don't fire unless fired upon three times or, you know, this kind of thing. Because every time we kill somebody, not just an innocent civilian, but an insurgent fighter who actually also is just a civilian only with a rifle, we create two more. And uh, or 10 more it was for every one we kill, we can't create 10 more for every two. We create 20. And so that's why our soldiers were supposed to try to act like, you know, the regular infantry were supposed to try to act like traffic cops while the special operations forces only go after just the bad guys at night. This kind of thing. That was total nonsense. And they gave up on it within a couple of months. Right. They quit Marja. Uh, or quit trying to pacify under their counterinsurgency doctrine by the end of March 2010. Three months, and they were done. They didn't even try it in Kandahar City whatsoever. And, you know, the ironic thing and perverse thing is that it's up until that time, and up until March from January, uh, you know, the, the media was just filled with all kinds of stories of success, and, and uh, especially with McChrystal you know, walking around with all these media folks that he would bring regularly over and just tell them what was succeeding. And, you know, they're walking around with all these cameras flashing everywhere. Uh, and, you know, in America, it's like, OK, cool, the government to box, all that stuff worked. And now then they're pushing the Taliban back and the people are supporting their, go you know, all of it was fiction. None of it was true. And, and you know, and you see it was very quietly uh, abandoned after that. And they moved on to other things. But you know, they were sure not quiet when they were selling the fiction. And unfortunately, as you said at this top of this show, it's all about perceptions. And, and, and you know, they left people in the United States who watched those first uh, episodes, if, if I can use that term, uh, from, from McChrystal and, and et cetera, that things were going well, that things were on the path. And then, of course, Petraeus in that same month, we have to point that out, of March in 2010, uh, he also starts telling everybody that, that things are going better and things are succeeding across the board, et cetera. And all of it was fiction, but it has the implication on members of Congress who most of – well, none of whom actually go into the combat zones. They just – some of them went to Afghanistan to be briefed and you know, and shown the dog and pony show, as it's called. Uh, but most don't know anything, and though certainly the American people only know what they're being told, and they're – historically believe what a general is going to tell him because of course he's not going to lie to us and that's the impression that's why the war kept going year after year because they keep hearing and have the impression of success and then they just you know they kind of wonder well why does the war not end but since the only message just relentlessly imposed on the american public is this fiction of success you know that's why it was continuing to be popular to support because americans at their heart uh, want to help people. There's so many really good Americans, so many great soldiers that I've met with who were given these impossible tactical missions. You mentioned them a second ago about how they were told, you know, to go after the hearts and minds and try to, you know, not kill anybody that's not supposed to be, you know, to all these things. They did that sincerely. They did the best they could to accommodate that. And they genuinely wanted to help people, but they're given an impossible mission. And all it does is get them killed get them with PTSD, uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, or just frustration. And then all these, you know, innocent civilians in Afghanistan killed for no reason at all, all because of the fiction that was per perpetrated. Yeah. And, you know, um, I was mentioning to, uh, Matthew Akins, who I was interviewing earlier, the, uh, freelance reporter who covered the Afghan war about how, there's this clip. You may have seen it. It's in my YouTube margin all the time. YouTube's been trying to make me watch it for years. It's this guy's wearing a kind of brown sport coat and he's smoking a cigarette and he has kind of long 70s hair. And it says Vietnam veteran talks about his experience. And it's about 15 minutes long, something like that. And he just sounds exactly like he's talking about the war in Afghanistan. It's more brutal in Vietnam, what he's describing. In fact, he says the, his first day there, he was a Marine. His first day there, he walks up, and Marines are throwing these old people off a bridge. And he's like, whoa, what in the world? Um, but anyway, same story as, as uh, Afghanistan, essentially, that, as, as I heard numerous times reported, and I guess in the phrase of a question for you is, how often did you hear this? But I definitely heard it reported numerous times 
throughout the war where soldiers would say, listen, the only mission here is trying to stay alive long enough to go home. That's it. Keep your buddy alive. Remember the guys talking about, yeah, my job, I'm a bullet sponge. I just, you know, <laughs> I hope I don't get one in a vital organ, but my job is to go out there and get shot at, which sucks. But nobody thought that they were nation building anything over there other than some state, uh, state department goon hiding behind a wall in Kabul. But well, no well, specialist well, out there believed that this was some actually happening did. or something. Some of them did. They got there with that belief. They believed that's right, what they right. were doing. They, when they got there, they, they tried to get that done. But yes, to answer your question, absolutely I did. In fact, I wrote on this in, in the, uh, the Armed Forces Journal piece. I specifically recorded uh, a, a key area in, in the, the south e, southwestern part of the country. I'm sorry, southeastern part of the country. Uh, where the unit had suffered all kinds of casualties uh, in the Argandab Valley. That's where it was. I remember now. And and that's exactly what the commander and the, told me that they, you know, he said, now they're just, they just want to stop the bleeding. They don't want to lose any more soldiers because they had lost a bunch in the first quarter of their deployment. Their first sergeant was killed. And I remember so vividly the, the commander telling me that he was just a- agonizing over when his tour was over, how he was going to go, and talk to the wife of his, you know, senior enlisted guy, his his first sergeant, and explain to her why he died. You know, what was he there for? What what value to the to the nation, to the unit, even was it? Because he said there isn't any. It was it was just a, I think it was a roadside bomb that got him, or or, or one of the uh, uh, assassination groups from the the Taliban that they were. Uh, you know, uh, busy with snipers. That was the two biggest killer. In fact, that was the primary killers. Um, and you know, he said that but they didn't. They he knows that they're not accomplishing anything. So they're really just trying to keep their guys alive and not putting them in foolish situations where they could, you know, end up getting in firefights and getting killed for no value. Uh, but you know, it's a struggle because you, you're there on a mission. You don't get the choice. You don't get the. You don't have the flexibility. I didn't have the uh, flexibility to just not do my job while I was there or to just leave. You can't. So you have to do the best you can to keep your troops alive uh, while still, though, obeying the orders that are given to you. And it's just such a a conundrum. And it's just a a criminal that we had to put our soldiers in such positions to have to make those kinds of agonizing phone call or visits to the widows of, of the soldiers that they lost and trying to not create any more widows by getting any anybody else unnecessarily killed and still accomplishing the mission that you're ordered to every day. It is just a horrible situation that should never have happened. Yeah. So um, now a year and a half after Fool's Aaron came out, the Washington Post published the Afghanistan Papers, which was essentially uh, debriefings yeah. of, of people involved, civilians and military, involved with the war that they gave supposedly in private, I don't know how candid all of them were being. Some of them were being quite candid. Some of them knew this is going to leak out someday and were clearly being guarded for that reason. But it's, uh, well, I don't know. What'd you find in the Afghanistan papers when that hit? Well, yeah. I, I mean, Other I than just, the part where it goes, Horton was right. You could just read Fool's Aaron <laughs> and you'd be good. Yeah, good. Yeah, you could have, you could have, uh, you know, gotten this years earlier. Yeah, uh, I should have said Horton was right that Davis was right. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it, it was just intensely frustrating. Well, it turned out to be frustrating. Let me, let me back up. When I first heard about this, I thought, okay, now then you have mainstream Washington Post just blasting this stuff out there for everybody to read, and now then we see that you know the same thing that I had reported in 2012, the same thing you reported on, not just me, but on many people in your book and in all these uh, radio shows that you've done, podcasts and everything, that you've been beating this drum forever. Now then there's validation at the highest levels. Finally, something's going to happen. We're going to get some some kind of accountability here. Maybe this could even finally get to the point where the war is going to end. And it, it was the classic Washington stuff. It was a story for a couple of weeks and then died out and nothing happened. Nobody was held accountable, and you still to this day still have David Petraeus going on every TV show as you know, being as a respected expert in so many areas, even though we know he lied. I told you he lied. The Washington Post told people that, that he lied, and it's just self evident. And he's still saying those same things in the, in the Atlantic a couple of days ago. 
I mean, he's still getting like, yeah, it was probably two, 3,000 word essay. It was a huge one, allowing him to just repeat all of the things that were false he had said before. Uh, and, and I just, it's just dumbfounding to me how, how when such uh, abject, obvious failure, as, as graphically demonstrated one year ago, when the Afghan army and government collapsed in a single day, that all of our efforts for 20 years had been exposed for the fiction that they always were. And yet, not only is no one held accountable, but these guys, you know, like both Petraeus and, and McChrystal continue to be held in high regard. And I just don't get it. Yeah. Hang on just one second. Hey, y'all, they've got great deals on weed at thehempspot.com. The Hemp Spot specializes in Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol instead of Delta-9, so they can send it straight to you anywhere in America. Recently, a friend moved and didn't have a guy in his new town, but then he heard about thehempspot.com on my show and was saved, figuratively and literally, because if you use the promo code SCOTT, you get 15% off every order and free shipping on any order over $100. Legal jams, bud, gummies, and the rest in your state. TheHempSpot.com. Spell V T H C. You guys, my friend Mike Swanson has written such a great revisionist take on the early history of the post World War II national security state and military industrial complex in the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy years. It's called The War State. I have to say, it's the most convincing case I've read that Kennedy had truly decided to end the Cold War before he was killed. In any case, I know you'll love it. The War State by Mike Swanson. Well, I don't know if this is really the first time or not, but I know the earliest time that somebody found of me predicting a fall of Saigon moment in Kabul was 2012 in a conversation oh, wow, with really? Gareth Porter. Uh, but I think it was probably sooner than that. Because, you know, I've been talking with Eric Margulies all along since I started the interview show in like 2003 or something. And he's a major expert on Afghanistan because he had covered the 80s war. And so he knew mm. all of these warlords by first name and it, oh, you wow. know, everything. So um, I had a real leg up there. And at antiwar.com, of course, we had the great Kelly Vallejos. Uh, you know, she was the best of us on the surge then. But yeah. We had Justin and everybody. Um, you know, covering all of this during that time. So um, everybody at antiwar.com gets some credit for that. Uh, all right, now listen, David Petraeus, you report here, I didn't bother reading it. He says, uh, <laughs> no, the problem was we had a lack of resolve. Danny, does that even mean anything or what? No, of course not. It, 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 and, and neither does any of the rest of the stuff that he put in there about what we should have done and then how this, you know, this disastrous ending, quote, didn't need to happen at all is, is how he emphasizes it, using italicized words and everything to make, you know, to really drive it home that we could have won if only we had stayed forever, offering no evidence whatsoever to, to validate why staying longer would have achieved something that the first 20 years didn't. Or, and, and then ironically, well, not ironically, I guess pr predictably, uh, he gives himself credit for, of course, we got the inputs right and the strategy right while I was there. But then that darn old President Obama, he's the one who dropped the ball and didn't maintain all that stuff. And, you know, and he set us up for failure by saying, yeah, we're going to have a, a, a withdrawal even before we had gone in there. Not mentioning anywhere in there. This is something I pointed out and would love to do here again. That he didn't point out at that particular moment that he himself had said, yes, Mr. President, we can definitely do this in 18 months. And no, Mr. President, to directly answer your question, if in 18 months it doesn't work, no one's going to say we should keep staying. That was in 2009. Yep. OK. And now then in 2022, he's saying we should have stayed longer, that not only was more than 18 months, it's now been a full decade plus, he's still saying that we should. So look, look, Patrice, which was it? Was it, yeah, I agreed with this in 2009 that 18 months would do it, or is it 2022 that no, forever would have done it? And, and of course, there's, it's absurd to suggest that, and yet that's, that's, the, that's the argument he's making. So it, it is, we need to expose that for the, just the illogic that it is. Mm. Hey, a surge by definition is temporary. You want to call it an escalation, just call it an escalation and a permanent one. 
So even by his own reckoning, he's a damn liar there. But yes, you're absolutely right about that. You know, and I try to bring this up as often as I can, that Petraeus himself is the one who promised he would have the Taliban on their knees with a big bloody nose, begging him for a piece of paper to sign on America's terms by July 2011. And then that didn't happen. So... You know, what other standard are we supposed to hold him to, Danny, yeah. other than his own? Yeah. Other than his own. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And, you know, and I, I just long for the day when when the media and, and the reporters, you know, across the board start calling him out on those things and saying, uh, wait a minute. Here's what you said. Here's what you said. Here's what you said then. And here's what happened. And here's what you're saying now. Please reconcile these irreconcilable yeah. positions. Unfortunately, they don't. Yeah. And and. Well, and as you said then, he knew he was lying then. It's just like he knows he's lying now. One of the big tells back then was he would say, well, we're having all this success, as you paraphrased it earlier, too. They never said victory. Forget victory. We got the new edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. Victory's not in there. Success is the best we can promise you. But even that success, why, it's fragile and reversible. Reversible, yeah. Meaning yeah. it's not really progress at all. It's just that, yeah, if you put a bunch of Marines with a bunch of weapons in a place, the enemy is going to stay outside of artillery range from them, I guess. <laughs> you know, otherwise, you're not really doing anything. Yeah, I remember even look, seeing look, here, a... Here's what it was. It, it was like if you have a bucket of water and you clench your fist and you jam that hand into the water, into the bucket, the water will displace. It will move around because it is powerless. It's just it, wherever you want to put your fist, it will displace the water until you pull your fist out and the water will roll back in and no one will even know your fist was ever in there. Right. That's what happened in Afghanistan. So everywhere we sent these surge forces and, and everywhere we had a base, we could secure and hold that terrain. The, the Taliban did not at any time, not even a tiny little meter of ground take from us. They couldn't. But the second we left every single place we were at, they just rolled back in as though we were never there. Yep. And that was always going to be the case. And it was always predictable. But that's, you know, they, they brought the camera career where the hand was in the water. It's just look how strong we are. And then the cameras left and then the fist came out. and The cameras never went back to see the obvious. Yeah. Well, and they also, as part of their heroic restraint, had these rules where no group is allowed to go more than this amount of distance in radius away from their fire base. So you right. essentially have just these little bubbles where the Taliban doesn't go because they'll get Absolutely. shot, but they know. Absolutely. Yeah. So I even saw like a graphic. I, I'm almost certain it was a military production of a slide that show like a map of Southern Afghanistan from some kind of sort of, you know, three quarters angle that showed like little bubbles on the map. This is where our guys are, and there's a little bubble of what they call stability, right? The piece of desolation around our little fire bases. But everywhere we're not, the Taliban still is. And it's their Islamic emirate. We just didn't call it that until they sacked Kabul. But that's what they called it all along. Right. And it already was there. <laughs> it's just funny to see it represented like that. Little bitty yeah, bubbles and, across and, and, the and, and, Helmand and, and, province, you know. What I did in so many of those cases to include that one I mentioned a minute ago about the the the, the joint patrol with the Polish groups is that we would go on these long uh, uh, patrols through, through cities, uh, you know, walking through villages or whatever. And and I remember so vividly talking with at that time the the uh, platoon leader that was leading the patrol for the Polish. I asked him how often he went through this particular village and just to just to give you a, a sense of how that happened. So we were mounted in, in, in Polish combat vehicles, you know, going down a certain route. And then when we got to this village, um, everybody dismounted or, or a lot of them dismounted. The, the vehicles continued to go through the village at, at walking pace. There was troops on either side of the road walking through. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I actually have pictures of this. I've published. You have the people that would come out basically along the parade route and they were just sitting there watching us. Uh, some men were sitting in some places and kids and girls and, you know, and little girls or whatever were, were watching, you know, from their, from their windows, some on top of the buildings. And then we, we uh, got to a, a rally point at the end of the village, everybody mounted back up and we continued, you know, on, to roll to the next place. And I asked the, the platoon leader during that last halt before we remounted, 
I said, how often do you come to this town? He goes, mm, about once every six or eight weeks. And I said, well, do you meet with like the village elders or anything? Or, or you know, do you have any kind of engagement with them? He goes, no, no, we just, it's a presence patrol. And, and I'm, it, it, I looked back at those pictures subsequently and I'm like, you know, here is this group of four or five men on the side just sitting there watching us. And I'm like, for all we know, those guys could be talking openly about, you know, planning the next attack against us. And no one would even know it because we don't speak their language and we, they didn't have any interpreters with them. Uh, but even if they didn't, <clears throat> the second that we left the ground, that's all there was. And then it, the Taliban was there. A separate one. Let me tell you about this one. A separate one in, in the really close to the U.S. patrol. I believe it was the 82nd Airborne, very close to the Pakistan border. We again went to a village and this they were actually getting biometric data at that time. On the on the on all the Afghan people, they were collecting so that they would know who they were to allegedly to ensure their safety and whatever. But uh, there was I, I saw such anger in some of the faces because we were going into this village, and and you know and we asked them, are the Taliban here? No, no, absolutely not. No Taliban here. Definitely they don't come here. And uh, so we did this biometric stuff. We left, and before we left. Uh, the, some of the Afghan guys who were kind of doing patrolling around the village while we were in the inside of it captured a Taliban guy uh, who had some ball making materials physically on him. And, you know, they took him to the to the village elder who had just said there are no Taliban here. And they go, uh, what about this guy? Oh, I don't know where he came from. Well, then he subsequently says, look, he goes, here's the thing, man. Yeah, there's Taliban here. But every time you guys come here, you put us at risk because they come and shake us down afterwards. So hell no, we're not going to do anything for you because all it's going to do is put us at risk because you're going to leave and not come back. And that was endemic across the entire country. Everybody was like that. Nobody was ever going to side with us who was going to leave, whether Obama set a deadline or not. Everyone knew we were eventually going to leave. And the Taliban, who are Afghan people for the majority, are always going to be there. So that was always the case. And one of the other practical, fundamental reasons, this was never a winnable war. Man, the lack of resolve I hear in your voice there. All, all, <laughs> all these rational arguments, Danny, uh, they make so much sense. Um, look, the country is the size of Texas, which is if anybody's ever been to Texas or driven across Texas or flown near Texas and seen it out the window or anything. It's really big. Um, and it's badlands too, right? Mountains and deserts and oh, yeah. warriors with rifles all over the place. So who would try it? Oh, and landlocked, uh, not just behind, not just <laughs> a, a nation away from the sea, but behind a mountain range too. So to even get there, you got to take a highway for a thousand miles before you can even take a left and get where you're going. A little bit of a difficulty there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, sorry, I'm going to let you off the hook in just a minute here, but I want you to talk about the real argument here is about staying last year that that irresponsible Trump and uh, his peace deal Biden should have backed right out of it and he should have said Taliban we're staying get used to it and we'd still own that Bagram Air Base and then we could still kill bad guys and everything would be great and quitters never win and so it's all the Americans fault after all they could have stayed right the Taliban had no actual literal firepower ability to force a full American withdrawal. In fact, we just take every last soldier in Germany and put them in Afghanistan in a week and then um, escalate the war right back up again and stay for another until the dollar breaks. Uh, and so therefore quitting is losing. And it's just because of, you know, Joe Biden's fecklessness and that kind of thing. And so what do you say to that? Yeah, I, I just, I, I shake my head in just in, in astonishment that this even has to be said out loud, yet it does, because we have proven, proven over 20 years, and for all the reasons that we just talked about in this, this whole podcast here, that it was a physical impossibility, as close as it could possibly come, to being an unwinnable war, meaning under any circumstances, with any amount of, of inputs or numbers of troops or years of service, et cetera, to win this war. It, it just was never was. And, you know, we've been arguing. 
Yeah, but Danny, they just needed to not lose, right? That's their argument, is we could yeah. have stayed, and that's not even success, but it's not... It's just not leaving. The, yeah, yeah, and it's at least... Yeah. The pretension, at least, is that we'd have been able to continue to prop up the government in Kabul to at least, for yeah, safe, uh, for face-saving for sure. purposes of nothing else, right? Yeah, I don't know about this. I don't even know whose face they're trying to say because all it was going to be doing was making us lose face. Because, look, I, I had even talked to some of our allies. I, I'm talking to our allies, people who were on our side. And they were just puzzled as to why do you keep st- doing something that can't succeed and just continue to lose your troops continue to spend these billions per month. Why do you keep doing that? That doesn't make any sense. So yeah, we could have continued to puzzle our allies. We could have continued to waste American money and waste American lives and kill Afghan people and keep it in a perpetual state of war. Yeah, that's that's something we could have done. We have the capacity to do that. But I mean, under what possible rationale does that make any sense? And let me answer the question that some may actually put to theirs. Yeah, but that would have allowed us to keep going after bad guys. And, and terrorists and whatever. Okay, we proved last week, I think it was, that we took out Amin al-Zawahiri, the leader of al-Qaeda, when we had no troops in Afghanistan, in Kabul. And we took out al-Baghdadi of ISIS in Syria, where we had no troops in that area. Where And they didn't even, the ones we did have in there had nothing to do with that raid. Or when uh, President Obama took out Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, we had no troops on the ground there. We can deploy troops anywhere and deploy combat power anywhere there's a direct threat to the United States. We do not need troops there. So all those alleged troops that were there to get bad guys, as they are often called, we're nothing but shooting a bunch of people who had no threat, made no threat to the United States. We're never going to be a threat, even if they hated us, Scott. They don't have the capacity to attack us. Only the people who do, like Zawahiri, or possibly even Baghdadi, and even I'll put that in only a possible, but only somebody who has a global reach uh, and, and the wherewithal to get to us, that's a valid target and it remains so. But we have the capacity to go after them anywhere in the globe uh, to this day. And we do not need those. So those troops that we had in Afghanistan were a drain on our, on our security because it was a drain to go after things that weren't even a threat to us. And it cost us potentially our intelligence ability to look for those that might represent a threat to us. And so I just violently, vehemently, sorry, vehemently reject anybody who says that our security was threatened because we withdrew troops out of Afghanistan because we have proven it does not. Yeah. And boy, for all their crocodile tears about it, they sure forgot all about it a minute later. And especially all about the women and girls that they cared so much about who are now going hungry. And thank goodness all the other nations of the world are stepping up to feed them. Because otherwise they're just completely out of sight, out of mind. You know, if they're not within a thousand miles of our Green Berets, they don't count. So what difference does it make, you know? Um, yeah, and, it's it's pathetic. And yeah, I mean, they act like, yeah, we could have just left our, you know, five or 10,000 troops at Bagram and then that just would have been fine. As though they wouldn't have had to dump another 50,000 in there to fend off the new Taliban offensive at that point. You know, like yeah, the Taliban, somehow we're going to acquiesce to that. When all they'd acquiesced to was that we'd promised we were leaving. And they said, OK, that was always their demand was get the hell out. Yeah. And, and look, and, and, and I, I. I commend President Trump for coming up with that deal, even though he took a lot of heat. And Me I too. commend President uh, Biden for following through and getting them out of there And because he took a lot of political heat. He took heat that nobody else would take, even Trump. Trump could have done this while he was in, uh, or, uh, in office. He actually said he was going to do it before he left at the end of 2020. And unfortunately, he didn't follow through with it. I, w- I really wish he had it. He could have gotten a lot of the credit. And ironically, if he had gotten us out under that time frame, probably the Taliban wouldn't have been able to roll in before we had left because right. they still were too far out. But the time, the additional time that gave them time to make their deals with the Afghan soldiers so that they didn't fight. It's not that the Taliban won the fight. They just made negotiated deals with the, ta- with the Afghan people to not fight and just hand the place over, which is exactly what they were doing when I was there. They just did it on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all that was predictable. So I- I'm glad that it's, it's over and, I regret that 
you have people like Petraeus still making money off of it and still being listened to, but uh, at least we're out and no more soldiers are being killed. Yeah. And listen, that is such a crucial point that even when it comes all the way down to it at the bottom line, how do they screw up the withdrawal? By delaying it. By yeah. not getting it over with. The thing was supposed to be over by the first day yeah. of hunting season. Instead, they kicked the can till the end of the summer. And so yeah, the Taliban, okay. as you're Let saying, me, took the yeah. whole country while they're leaving. Let, 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 I do need to address that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. The deal that Trump made, even though he said he was going to get out before the end of uh, 2021, he didn't. No, I'm sorry, 2020, he didn't. But the plan, the the agreement was right. that we would be out by May of, of 21. And if Biden had just stuck with that and followed that path, then we would have got we would have been able to get in complete order according to our own timelines. And there would have been at least the facade of a government still standing before, when we left because they, the Taliban had not progressed far enough to be able to do that. But the time that Biden delayed on not making a decision until I want to say after the deadline had passed, then that's when he came up with the August 31st one uh, that gave the Taliban the critical time they needed to be able to make the deals in time to just walk literally into Kabul. And if it hadn't happened for that, then those 13 uh, soldiers that died and the 200 civilians that were killed at the airport all would be alive today. You just have to admit that's the truth. Yep. All right, man. Well, listen, you're an American hero, and I really mean that, and I really appreciate your time on the show. I wanted to talk about Ukraine and China, too, but then I figure, you know, we only have 15 minutes before we're really pushing our luck on time here. And, uh, right. I, I'll, I and figure those, I'd rather pick this up. A while, so I'll look forward to coming back and talking on those, because there's a lot to be said there, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if we're not all dead in an H-bomb war, I'll meet you right. back here next Friday, right. if that's all right. Sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Danny. Really appreciate you. All right, you guys, that is the great Daniel L. Davis, retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army. Read him at 1945. It's the digits 19 and then the words 45.com there. And um, so first of all, we have David Petraeus is wrong, of course, about Afghanistan. And then China's military was built to defeat America in a Taiwan war. And Ukraine needs a miracle to drive Russia's military out of Kherson. Those are two great articles that we didn't get a chance to talk about today, but you can find all of that at 1945.com. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.